introduction. And I, I love it when I get those kind of introductions because um, until I hear it, I completely forget that I meet all these people and do all these events. And so thank you for the wonderful memory on top of the outstanding introduction. Uh, so I, I like to call myself the relentless Melanie Crawford. And over the next 40 minutes or so, you'll uh, understand better why I like to uh, brand myself as not only relentless, but also as a motivational comedian. Uh, not just a motivational speaker, but a motivational comedian, because laughter has been uh, thus far my best medicine. Um, so I also want to show you, it's probably backwards, but that's my tattoo and that's my brand and it says relentless and that's how committed I am to uh, my life as a survivor. So probably the first thing I should do is tell you a bit about myself and how I came to be a survivor of traumatic brain injury. Uh, when I was 19 years old, I was hit by a drunk driver and I hit my face off the steering wheel at 80 kilometers an hour. Um, essentially, just to you know, give you the quick picture, uh, I broke both my arms. I broke my left hand clean off my arm and I uh, was basically... Um, never the same person again. So as a lot of you as survivors or caregivers would have heard, or you know, we've come to understand that in a lot of cases as a survivor, we're just not the same person. Uh, and we mourn who we once were and have to learn how to be this new version. Or in my case, these new versions, because I have a few of them and I'm quite proud, thank you. And uh, so I want to give you my prognosis because once um, I was diagnosed with a brain injury, it came with a lot of extra things. So on top of all of the, you know, the physical injuries and, and the, the various aspects that came with that. Um, and, you know, this, by the way, is 24 years ago. I don't know if I mentioned that. Uh, so I was 19 and uh, I was diagnosed with traumatic frontal low brain injury causing um, a variety of, of mental illnesses. Um, and not necessarily causing, sorry, but um, resulting in behaviors and, and symptoms uh, such as borderline personality disorder, bipolar, rapid cycling disorder, mood disorders, um, and well, isn't that enough, really? Right? Isn't that enough? <laughs> I mean, those should be letters I get to put on my business card, right? You have a PhD? I have BPD. I think, I think we're, you know, there's qualifications there that need to be recognized. And uh, so this was what I was told, right? This was my diagnosis. And the thing is, they also told me that I wasn't, I wasn't trainable anymore. I, 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 my frontal lobe injury had robbed me of critical thinking skills and I wasn't socially appropriate whatsoever. It robbed me of, um, you know, uh, my executive functioning, which is, executive functioning it's extremely important it's like the board of directors of my life uh was cleared out in an instance and nobody filled their spots you know and uh that was rough so they told me i wasn't trainable um that i was also unemployable uh, largely due to the fact that i wasn't trainable and that i would never be able to raise my own family and that was a hard blow at 19 years old you can probably imagine this is water, so far, the night is young. So, you know, uh, this is what I was told and here's what I came to understand after a lot of trial and tribulation that I, I you know, is another talk, right? It's just another talk for another day. But here's what I came to understand was that, yes, they said that I wasn't trainable and that I was unemployable and that I wasn't capable of raising my own family and damn it, they were right, you know? They were actually right. And that was also a hard pill to swallow, right? Um, but it did lead to the beginning of the relentless version of me. Um, and like I said, that's a long, long story that has a lot of gold and, and nuggets to pull out of it. Sorry if you can hear my dog barking, but he hears me talking, he wonders who's here. You would think he's used to me talking to nobody by now, <laughs> or, you know, myself. <laughs> But anyways, he's barking, and I apologize. I might bark back, but uh, uh, there's a long story there. There's a lot of more and more to, to share with you. 
but that's not the point of tonight. That's just to give you a little bit of insight into who I am and how I came to be for the rest of what we're going to talk about tonight. However, if you would like to learn more, you know, about how I evolved into, into being the relentless Melanie Crawford, you could certainly uh, check out my, my website or anything like that. You know, beyond tonight, you're always welcome to reach out to me. Relentless and Company, you're going to find me on the, way to the internet. So um, that is certainly not a closed door and not a story that I am afraid to tell. So here we're, here's where we're at. Everything they said to me and everything they diagnosed me with was correct. Uh, they were true. And, and so here's what I did. Um, went to five years, I went through five years of cognitive rehabilitation. So some people have an accident and they have to learn how to perhaps like um, take care of themselves physically. Maybe some people have to relearn to walk or, you know, some people are, are left with um, needing to learn how to speak or, or feed themselves. Like there's just a variety. I mean, you know, brain injury is as unique as uh, DNA for each of us. And, and then I couldn't, I didn't know how to think anymore. I, I had no moral uh, compass. Uh, like I said, I, if you imagine a, a, a company, a very successful company, I would add, a 19-year-old extremely successful company, you know, like potentially Fortune 500 company, um, get their board of direct directors wiped out and not replaced and still try to operate. And it's just, a, it was a disaster, uh, right? And so I had to do something and I had to rele relearn how to think again. And another long story short is that cognitive behavioral therapy taught me how to build a personality using algorithmic thinking. Algorithmic thinking. It is the extreme end of logic. There's just, there's no gray area, okay? And through five years of that, I was able to develop a socially appropriate personality using algorithmic thinking for getting, you know, getting in and out of situations and, you know, how to appropriately handle situations because there's a, there's a, there's a lot of comedic material in my years of non-cognitive rehabilitation. I'm just going to say that, right? There's a ton of it. And uh, so the cognitive rehabilitation taught me how to do that, you know, build a socially acceptable personality because the one that I had wasn't good. Uh, it wasn't functional. Now here's my question. If, you, if you're gonna teach me how to build a personality, why wouldn't I build several, right? Like why wouldn't I build all the ones that I need? <laughs> like <laughs> you just gave me the recipe for how to build a personality. Why would I stop there, right? You told me I, I was unemployable. Well, what if, what if I build a, a, an employable personality, right? Why can't I do that? Why can't I do that? And the thing is, I can't do that because I have brain damage and I, and I really can't stand to let two people tell me what to do and I can't stand to show up on time and I can't remember what my schedule is. And so there are real facts of why I can't hold a traditional job, but I became a serial entrepreneur. And so that just means uh, I, I, I self-employed. I, I, I found a way to make money uh, non-traditionally. You know, and, and thank God for that because uh, every other thing I tried was was failing, and so I started business and I call myself this to this date a serial entrepreneur uh, because it's worked. I mean, I'm 24 years in and I am truly unemployable. You know, I, I, the only job that I actually ever held uh, successfully since my accident was ironically as a career counselor because I'm super duper good at getting jobs. I got all that charm and I'm like able to retain what I'm supposed to retain, right? I get jobs like a madman. I can teach you how to get a job because I know exactly how to do it. I know, I know what they're expecting. I know how to, you know, I know how to coach that. Uh, but man, if you want to keep that job, I'm not your girl, right? <laughs> this is how it is, right? But it's not about what I can't do. It's about what I can. And the same is true for all of us. So I took what I could do and I turned it into businesses, many, many of them, and most of them failed. Because <laughs> that's what happens. And that's why I have to be relentless, right? Everything is not going to happen the way you think it's gonna happen. And that's why, uh, that's why there's make your own wine places, you know? That's what I've taken to is making my own wine, but this is still water. And I digress, that was off topic. At any rate, 
They said um, also uh, that I wasn't trainable. And so the reason for that is because I'm uh, very impatient and I have like a lot of focus issues. I'm very easily distracted. And, you know, like basically if I'm awake, the only thing that I think consistently is what's next. Doesn't matter how much fun I'm having, how much I love what I'm doing. It's just, that's who I am now is what's next, what's next, what's next. So it's very hard to pay attention. I used to love to read. Not no more. I haven't picked up a book in so long because I can't get through a paragraph because I can't, I can't, can't pay, pay attention that long. So, you know, there's just little things that, that are, that are uh, tricky. And that's, that's why they deemed me untrainable is, you know, they're talking again in, in uh, normative or traditional terms, right? Uh, so I thought, well, the only thing I have learned since my accident is, is like how to build a personality in cognitive rehabilitation. And it didn't really make any sense to go out there and try to make a living by teaching people how to have multiple personalities. Uh, you can imagine why. So instead, it, I, I, I just decided to teach people what I learned through algorithmic thinking. And I decided to simplify it and build it into a curriculum that was guaranteed. And that's the, and the reason why it's a guaranteed curriculum is because it's algorithmic. That's a finite equation. So I became a corporate speaker and a corporate facilitator uh, where all I did was teach my own curriculum. And I called it whatever they wanted, right? They wanted to call it uh, dealing with difficult people. Sure, let's call it that. But I'm going to teach the same thing I teach when I go in and I teach how to have self-esteem, right? Because it's a universal truth. It just works. It's algorithmic. It's guaranteed. And if you begin to think this way, and if you, you know, use these processes, you will achieve what you set out to achieve. And, you know, I got very successful because I had, uh, I was changing environments wherever I went. And, and it was awesome. I loved it. It was such good therapy for me because it's very hard to fall off the wagon when you're driving it. Right? You know, like when it's your thing that you do every day, it's, it's hard to forget. And I forget quick. So uh, it was a good time. Um, and then, you know, I, you know uh, the humor part, it kind of comes naturally to me because once again, <laughs> my life's a joke. So I don't know about you, but I might as well tell it, right? <laughs> it's way more than a punchline though, you know, and I'm, I'm blessed for that. So normally, as you know, I would be standing in front of you delivering this message. And here's where we transition into something that's different than any other message I've given before, because everything I've said up to this point has come out of my mouth before. It's, uh, it's my story. It's my truth. It's, it's all those things. And, and I, maybe I pepper it up differently sometimes, or I sometimes sing songs if I'm live, because I, you know, I like to be multi personality <laughs> faceted, talented, you put whatever you want behind multi, and that's me. And uh, I'm sad that it's not happening today, but I'm, I'm very happy that this is instead. So for those of you here, cheers to you. Thank you so much for your time and your attention. And uh, it's my intention uh, to be deserving of it. So, as you know, uh, I said earlier that having a TBI is as unique for each of us as our DNA. It's never the same, although there are tons of points of relatability between us. Um, none of us exactly experiences the same thing, which you can imagine is tremendously difficult even for caregivers and loved ones because, you know, everything has to be a hands-on learning experience with who we are, who, you know, because, like, it's just, we're that unique. Um, but, but, boy, are we beautiful, right? And um, I know that I had a whole bunch of, uh, we'll call them issues, you know? I dare say that my, my, well, actually, it's my friend John saying, but he likes to say that his issues have issues. Do you feel that? Like, <laughs> I feel that, right? Yeah, my issues have issues too. And, you know, I had a lot of those even before uh, we hit a global pandemic. And that's why everything that's about to come out now is new because, I mean, Nothing is the same, right? Even though I, I know, I, I, you know, all these things that I've already done in my life and that I've already accomplished and, and achieved and all these things that I've made a career out of telling other people how to do just became completely invalid because the whole world changed. And I um, literally spent months trying to learn, relearn how to walk my walk. 
because the ground was gone, right? And I know every one of us went through the same thing. But I did it. And that's why I get to talk to you today because it's another thing that's worth sharing. And it's another way to say all the stuff I've already said, but it's just another perspective on learning it. And maybe it's your perspective and maybe you'll take a bunch away from tonight. And even if you don't learn anything, hopefully you laugh and that feels good too, right? That's all I got. Plus I put sparkles on for you. Can you see? It's spark it, literally in a can. I sprayed sparkles. Thank you for having me tonight so that I had a reason to sparkle up. This is awesome. Here's a couple of the things that I experienced before the pandemic, before the whole world took a crap, right? The, uh, these are what some, of the, some of the things that I, I had to deal with. Maybe you can relate. I have to live in a controlled environment. This is not an option. If you want a version of me that isn't ready to scrap, fight, be irritated or miserable, I need to live in a controlled environment. That doesn't mean I need to be controlling. Big difference. I just need to live in a controlled environment. I need certain structure. That is different than, uh, you know, <coughs> excuse me, the average person. I have a huge noise sensitivity. Huge. Uh, volume or sounds are directly related to my anger switch. Instant fuse like boom. Right? wrecks my day it's just like a, a real issue i have to carry earplugs a lot of places i have unfiltered emotions that's awesome it makes it makes me a great comedian but you know what <laughs> makes me a really terrible pmser <laughs> really terrible <laughs> but anyways i digress again uh i am a, an extremely logical thinker uh, again, this is my survival technique because this is how I learned how to actually get a life back. But it does make me tricky to be around because uh, humans by nature are emotional creatures. And I don't know how to either be one or the other. I'm either all logic or all emotion and neither one is fun to work with. So cheers to our caregivers. Uh, memory issues. W weird. Like uh, usually my memory issues are about emotion. I forget how I feel about things. I forget how it, you know events make me feel uh, to the point that I will repeat the same mistake over and over again, right? Like I've often wondered if maybe that's why I had four kids before I realized I didn't even want any. That was a joke. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, now you're laughing. Good. <laughs> Whew. You guys were worried for a second. I know it. I know it. But I do. I have those memory issues, and that makes me very vulnerable um, because yeah, uh, it's easy to take advantage of me. And I'm sure some of you can relate to that as well. Focus and concentration area, uh, uh, issues, word finding issues. Blah. First day with the new lips. Uh, personality issues. Uh, I'll split, I'll switch just instantly, right? If, uh, if too much emotion comes across me and I'm not sure I can handle it or I'm worried I'm gonna have an outburst, I'll just turn it all off. It's all or nothing with me, right? Again, the logical thinker. These are the things I had to deal with on a daily basis before there was a global pandemic and before we were quarantined. Now, if you remember, there was three main things that they told me in my uh, prognosis. You'll never work again. You're not employable. You can't, you, you're, not, you're untrainable. And we, we talked about those. We talked about becoming a serial, a serial entrepreneur and how I started teaching the things that I learned. But they also said, I'll never be able to raise my own family. And that was true too, and I do have four kids. So you might be wondering, how does that work, right? Well, I'll tell you something. I married a man that also has a brain injury. We thought that was smart, but we have brain damage. <laughs> and it's not, I'm not saying it was stupid, but I'm telling you, it didn't work. It did not work. Uh, we, we did our best. Uh, we got married and we had three kids and what we decided to do is we restructured a failed marriage into a completely cohesive co-parenting partnership that we've been doing successfully since 2014. So successfully that we actually have toured a, a comedy show together, a motivational comedy show on stage together with my ex-husband, my co-parent, uh, and it, we call it The X-Files, motivational comedy show. And, and we tell the story. And so, uh, you know, I can't raise a family on my own and I don't. You know, I just restructured my life to, to have the environment that works. And it's a lot of work, but uh, that's what cognitive rehabilitation helped me achieve. 
Um, I want to, I don't know about you, but uh, I, I want to talk about the pros and cons of this quarantine because I think uh, traditionally everybody is complaining. It's easy to do. It's easy to go to the things that we don't like and it's easy to go to the things that are causing us problems and it's just easy. Um, so I'm going to switch that up I'm, and I want to just be daring and I'm going to say let's just talk a little bit about the pros and cons because there were both, you know, let's be honest. I mean, part of the quarantine for me was like, I loved it. I, I, I didn't have to, you know, small talk or, you know, I mean, I used to, I used to actually go to the grocery store and take advantage of the fact that I can shape my own eyebrows because if I wasn't in the mood to like run into people, I would just draw them on angry. Then people wouldn't approach me, <laughs> you know, so parts of this have been helpful for me. Um, so pros and cons, I wrote a list, got some notes here. One of the pros of quarantine, by the way, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my kids. Okay. Uh, my first son, David, he's grown up and out on his own. He's 21 years old. And then the other three are uh, eight, nine, and 10. Uh, my eight-year-old son, Emmett, my nine-year-old son, Elijah, we call him Eli, and uh, my 10-year-old daughter, Hope. These are my kids that I've been quarantined with. So pros and cons. Truth is, it's a pro. The kids are home all day. We're together all the time. Con, the kids are home all day. We're together all the time. Pro, I can get my groceries delivered. Now, I don't think there's anything I hate more than the grocery store. Like, <laughs> holy balls, I do not like the grocery store. The, the choices, the, the risk of running into people that you don't remember, the, like, the choices, the need for a, a list that you don't remember. Do you see where I'm going here? Like, it sucks. I hate it. Hate it. Now, all of a sudden, it's the norm to get your groceries delivered. And you don't even have to open the door. <laughs> you just wave from a distance. Like, this is the life I've dreamed of. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. So, yeah, a pro is getting uh, the groceries delivered. It was awesome. The cupboards were stocked all the time. Uh, the con, everybody expected me to cook every day, like two, three times. Ridiculous, right? These kids, they want to eat constantly. Rude. Trying to build a career here, guys. <laughs> Pro, we used this time to build a phenomenal garden. Never in my life, you know, have I been expected to, uh, you know, raise raise my kids uh the way that i have lately and and it just made a lot of sense we had a lot of time on our hands and we started a lot of stuff from seeds we grew a garden we built a garden we grew a garden still it's just i keep looking over here because it's just like oh it's beautiful it's over here just beckoning me you know it's just this brand new aspect of life that's just so awesome right that's a huge pro and it comes with a huge con because i've also discovered i can't grow bacon it sucks mm. Things they should tell you ahead of time. How are we doing for time, by the way? I just flipped my pen. Oh, look at that. Look at that. We're doing great. I wish I could sing and I wish we were like together having some cocktails by the pool. Remember, I said I get distracted? <laughs> I wasn't lying. <laughs> oh, man. So I don't know about you guys, but I was plagued during the quarantine. Um, for most of it, to be honest, uh, I was plagued with, uh, I, I want to call it the, the condition of just not knowing anything. So, uh, you know, I literally wrote down in, in, I call it the disease of, I don't know how, I don't know when, I don't know why, I don't know where, I don't know who, you know, I don't know anything. I literally felt um, helpless just because it seemed like I was supposed to, like, it just seemed like I, 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 nothing is what I used to think it was. And I didn't know what to think anymore. And there was just like so many obstacles there. Um, all of us probably struggled for different reasons. I mean, a lot of my, my friends um, talked about anxiety spikes and, you know, I was like, no, I, I don't feel like I'm having anxiety. But then I learned that everything happening to me was anxiety. I just, I just wasn't clear on, you know, how many forms anxiety could take, right? Um, so much. I'm sure all of us went through it. And, and here's what I found, though, right? And here, here's my point of pivot. 
yeah, that's a jackpot word. Nailed it. You guys will find out later why that's so important because somebody else will tell you because I don't want to lose my train of thought, but I wanted to use that word tonight and I did. But here's my pivot point um, in this pandemic. Okay, so that's what that's what I really want to stress to you guys. Like, this is nothing new for me. It's nothing new for me to relearn. And it's like you know the story of the phoenix. Like you 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 you, you burn up and you turn to ashes, and then you create new and you come back. And it's just however whatever your analogy is, it's all the same. But here's my recent uh, you know truth: is I learned that as a, a TBI survivor, as a TBI survivor, right? The thing that I often feel cursed by. Um, I realized that this is not the first time I have faced colossal unknowns. Like that is not new for us. It's just not right. We, we, our life is full of it. Um, that is the very nature of a TBI, the unknown, you know, therefore, if as a TBI survivor, it's not the first time that I have faced the unknown, that means I'm experienced. And if I'm experienced, then I can't really validate my own feelings of helplessness or uselessness because I've just kind of canceled that out by, you know, validating that I am actually experienced at, you know, surviving the unknown. I still haven't figured out how or why, and I'm not telling you I felt any better yet, but it's a step because the way that you change direction in your life is one degree at a time, but just one, right? And that was my first degree. So I did that a couple of times and I'll tell you a couple more, uh, at least one more of them. Um, the other thing that I that I realized another pivotal moment for me was um, the, the the fact is that it's true that I need assistance in my life. I, I need assistance. I need assistance with daily life activities. I need assistance with all kinds of things because like you just can't pour this together without help, you know? So I realized it's a fact that I need assistance. And here I am quarantined with not one, but two, but both of my life partners, my ex-husband, co-parent, and my boyfriend, quarantined together in the house with the three kids, the dog, the two cats, and the three guinea pigs. It's a zoo, but we're happy, man. So this is, these are the things, these are my one degree points of pivot where I start to, I start to uh, empower myself into uh, better thoughts because I cannot continue to feel useless if I've proven to myself that I have experience in this and I cannot uh, validate myself for feeling helpless. And, and you understand, I'm talking about myself. I'm talking about validating myself, not, you know, no, not blaming, not, you know, not me, this is me, my work. I can't feel uh, uh, helpless uh, while I'm quarantined with the only two people in the world that are even <laughs> equipped or even want to help me. They're right here, right? So, so this is where I start to make the changes. And uh, this leads into something I call thought replacement. Very traditional, very standard. You've probably heard it therapy if you haven't heard the words thought replacement. And I'm not, you know, I'm not insinuating that you've all been to therapy or, or that you need it. None of that, right? I'm just saying. Maybe at some point you've heard about thought replacement as a mental health uh, technique. And can you tell that somebody's been offended at me possibly suggesting they went to therapy before? It's like sometimes this shit just falls out of my mouth and then. I go, oh, sorry. <laughs> so what, what, what was the, yeah, thought replacement. Yep. And the, this is the technique. What happens when you replace a thought? So you understand like what I'm talking about, those one degrees of changes, right? So what was happening was I thought I, 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 I felt, uh, I felt useless. So if you can imagine feeling useless, then I can imagine, then you can probably imagine the kind of thoughts you have while you're feeling useless, right? And they just all feed that disease of feeling useless. So once I was able to um, replace, uh, you know, invalidate that feeling of uselessness and tell myself I have experience, uh, it changes my thoughts. And, and that changes my perspective. And a change in perspective will always, and again, it has to be only one degree. It doesn't have to be massive, but a change in perspective will bleed out into your life 
uh, whether it's positive or negative, that's the beautiful thing. That's a beautiful thing about a universal law and a logical algorithm is that if it bleeds, it bleeds. It doesn't matter what direction you cut it, right? So now I have a different perspective and that perspective is helping me have different thoughts one by one every day, right? Every thought I replace changes a little bit of my perspective, changes what I'm thinking. And if it changes what I think, it changes what I speak. And if it changes what I speak, then it changes what I do. And now I'm starting to change my behavior. And all I mean by that, and you might think, oh, this is, there's no, you know, this isn't magic. It can't happen like that. But you, you got to understand how small the scale is that I'm talking about here. A change in behavior means I didn't wake up wanting to don't wake up. And I don't, I'm not necessarily talking about suicide ideology. I'm talking about just like, ugh at life every day right like zero zest and maybe one day i woke up with just a tiny little trickle of wanting to have a shower maybe you know like and then i think about how much work it is and i'm like meh you know but then like the next day i, I maybe want to have a shower and i think about how much work it is and i go into the bathroom this time and then i go meh Right? And that's, that's how simple it is, right? But my behavior is changing, regardless. I don't need it to be monumental changes for it to be a change, right? So what's happening now is I'm heading into an upswing. Lord, love me an upswing. Woo, man. And I can feel it coming, right? Because I know, I know that one day if I wake up and I think about showering, I know that within a week, I will have nailed it, right? And after the shower comes having a breakfast and after having a breakfast comes taking a vitamin you know and all and I know the upswing's coming and I'm ready for it and I buckle in and I'm ready for it and so while I'm in the upswing I make a game plan because that's the only time I'm thinking clear enough to make uh what, what am I call it what do I want to um it's the only time I'm thinking clear enough to make uh action steps like to make an actual plan um that I get to start at the behavior point. So I don't have to trick myself into starting at the brain point until I eventually reprogram all that garbage to exit out differently. But I can harness my upswing and start at the behavior point. And I can make plans to do that. And, I, and, and that's what I call it. I just call that like, uh, uh, you know, harness your upswing, make your game plan. Um, and then the very, the very next thing is you just have to share that with everybody that you love right? Um, that's the newest thing that I learned, guys. Like, this is the new, this is like the new curriculum coming out is going to be all about this little add-on piece because uh, I've been very self-centered in my recovery. I mean, I know what I need from people and I'm very happy and uh, usually to accept it, usually. Um, but I have never uh, included people in my recovery like I have lately, and that's because like they were never gone. Like I had no choice. <laughs> Man, they were always around though. Oh, <laughs> I was so scared for a while, honestly, guys, because I was like, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to be a teacher for these kids. Like I don't know how to teach grade three, grade four, grade five. I don't know how to live with my ex-husband and my boyfriend under the same roof. Like, how do you do that? Right? I don't know how to do that. And I didn't know how to like never be alone again. Like that was terrifying. That was actually scarier than the whole boyfriend husband issue. It was like, <laughs> you're never going away. Like this, that's, that's, that sucks. Right. I mean, the best company I ever had is my own. And maybe I'm alone on that. Maybe I'm not, but man, I was scared. And, and, you know, I thought, I don't know how to answer the kids questions. I don't know how to be optimistic. I don't know how to, I don't know how to lie. I don't know how to, I, don't, I just, you know, and I hate saying I don't know. And there's all these, I don't know how to go without a manicure. Like, I love these. These, these make me feel so good. And then, you know, I, then I feel like, oh, how awful is it that you're worried about getting a manicure? And then, and then the other, you know, the other people inside me are like, yeah, it is awful. You know, and then all of a sudden I'm depressed and all, you know, I, I can't and I don't. And, I, and it's all the negatives. So that had to change, right? Um, 100%. So the greatest thing that I learned that I was, you know, leading up to before I got off on that tangent uh, was the sharing of it with the people you love. What that looks like for me is I all of a sudden, um, well, well, I had a breakdown uh, and it's not the first and it won't be the last, but my kids are, you know, they're a little bit older every time it happens and they, they have a little bit more understanding and they, they witnessed all of it. And a breakdown for me is just uncontrolled emotion. 
you know, over the top, uh, um, uh, blown out of proportion feelings, you know, not, not rage or anger or violence or, you know, uh, none of those things. Um, but, but, you know, a, a, an embarrassingly huge display of uncontrollable, um, distorted reality emotion. And uh, coming out of that was a huge learning curve, as I just explained to you, you know, all, all the stuff that I, that, I, that I did to slowly change my, my life one degree at a time. Um, and then we decided we're going to have family meetings once a week because mental health is so important for all of us. And none of this is, is something that any of us know how to do. And I'm not the only one that's responsible for doing it. I'm one of three adults in the house and there's three kids. And like, man, I, you know, when I transitioned from feeling like I have to lead everybody and I don't know how into, I need to equip my team because none of us know how, and we need to figure this out together. It changed everything. Um, now, so, you know, having a, a weekly checkpoint where basically, um, Everybody has the opportunity to discuss how life is affecting them. Because I'll tell you something, you get what you give. So, and I'm gonna kind of wrap it up after this because uh, Lord, I could go on, but uh, you get what you give. And what I mean by that is, um, I was so wrapped up in worrying about how I was handling everything and how I was going to teach my kids certain things and how I was gonna make my house a certain way um, that I forgot to actually engage in it I mean it's like I stepped out of it and tried to control all of it and never ever took a moment to even ask I wondered how am I going to tell my talk to my kids about uh, this pandemic but I spent all my time wondering I didn't even didn't even approach it right um, so it's very easy for for us to get lost in our own recovery or our own worlds or anything and that just applies to everybody in general so the family meeting provides everybody with an opportunity to say what's uh, what's been on their minds and wow what a perspective shift for for me again there's a fruit fly in here but uh, you know listening to them uh, and understanding they have their own concerns and their own worries and understanding that the scale of them is so much smaller than I had it in my head because I am an extremist and realizing that I do have the capacity to comfort them once I actually know what's bothering them, not just assuming I know, uh, what, a, what a success feeling. And I can't wait to hear every week. And this is, you know, this is applicable to me in my life because I'm a mother right now, but I can guarantee that if you said to me, Melanie, how would I, that's not applicable to me because I, I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a mother with a child. Doesn't matter. I guarantee you that I can help you figure that out because it's a recipe. It's, it's not an idea. It's, it, it is a, it's a, it's an algorithm. It's a solution. It is a method of human relations. And I forgot. And I actually, not only did I forget, but I, um, it took me a long time to figure out that I needed to learn a new technique. And, and what I love about human relations is that there's only one criteria it, and that criteria is that you're a human. So parent, child, boss, worker, senior, junior, husband, wife, brother, sister, like no other thing matters. If you're a human, these uh, techniques work at making your life better by one degree. And that's all you need. Because once you figure out how to get one degree, you figure out how to get rest. Much like that personality trick, <laughs> right? Those silly guys, why are they gonna tell me how it's a disorder after they taught me how to do it, right? Weird. At any rate, I'm really, really quickly going to say, um, uh, I have five, five, uh, five, not 10, five takeaway tips for you. Just the tip, because I want you to come back for more. That might have been over the line, I don't know. Here's my five takeaway tips. This is what the whole point of tonight's uh, talk was, you know, aside from just enjoying each other's existence. Number one, okay, I, number one. I got a weird sound in my ear. <laughs> Bear with me. It's like the guy that's telling me my speech. Just, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Number one, uh, have a running pros and cons list. Because remember I said to you about replacement thoughts? It starts with your pros and cons list because here's the trick that I teach people. They say, yeah, oh, all I got is cons. Well, guess what? You don't get to move on to the next stage until you match it with a pro. And that forces you 
that forces you to think the replacement thought, right? I don't even have to teach you that. I just have to say, make a pros and cons list. And you're going to feed me anyways. That's number one, okay? Have a running list. And when you're feeling all right, when you're feeling good, when they walk over to your list, I love to take, I don't know if you can see this, but see where I'm pointing the black area on my wall? That's a blackboard, okay? I've done that in every room on every wall. I just literally walk around the house with blackboard, chalk paint, right? Slap, 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 because I need notes everywhere. I just erased that so it looked pretty on camera, right? But it was full of notes before. And I write this stuff down. Uh, so pros and cons, I mean, when you're struggling in your mental health, I mean, if you, if, you know, if the doctor said you need this medicine and you need this antibiotic until you get better, how is it any different? If you need to track your pros and cons until you feel better, friggin' do it. It's easy and you will feel better. It's a guarantee, right? Pros and cons is step number one. Step number two is to turn the pros and cons into your replacement thoughts, right? So it's just taking that one little step further. You know, like I said to you, um, it, it's just uh, invalidating your distorted negative thoughts. That's where it starts. Um, number three, the takeaway tip from today was to make your game plan when you're in your upswing. And remember, think about how you can recognize that upswing. It's not huge. It's just one difference from the day before. And you can't find differences unless you're tracking. So please, you know, commit to tracking yourself if you want to enhance yourself. You have to know your baseline, right? I only know, I literally have an app on my phone every day. I have to plug in my app. It's a little sliding scale. Energy upon waking up, right? One to five. That's all I do. I wake up and I'd be like, if, if I'm feeling meh, I do a one. And if I'm like, woo, I don't even need a Ritalin today, right? I do a five. And if I wake up, happy to wake up, but need Ritalin, I do a three. And then I can look, I just I look, at, like, I look at a graph and I can be like, wow, I've had like a lot of consistent ones. Like maybe I need to start a pros and cons list. It's, it's literally that easy, right? And then uh, number four was to have a, a meeting with the people you love in your life to share all that you're doing for yourself. Um, and like, uh, I don't know if I completed this thought, but the thing was that you get what you give and, and in having this meeting with my family and hearing their own thoughts on what's happening, um, and understanding their expectations, um, it allowed me to comfort them. And by comforting them, I comforted myself and in, in that, you, you know, that's what I mean by you get what you give. So, and you, you need to take the time to find out what, uh, what you can offer instead of assuming, right? I'm bad for that. Um, and the very, very last thing that I'm going to end with tonight is that the most important takeaway tip is to always, always find humor in your life. And the number one way to do that is to follow the relentless Melanie Crawford. Okay, that's it. That's how you do it. <laughs> um, you guys have been awesome today. Uh, I'm just going to tell you real quick, keep an eye out on my website because I've started a new business with the quarantine. It forced me into uh, some changes. I can't be out in clubs and doing performances the way I used to. Uh, so I've started a new uh, online uh, show called Clean Cooking and Dirty Comedy, which is uh, going to be a weekly online show launching uh, this week. It's on the website. It's on the Facebook. Um, and it's just that. Uh, clean Cooking, Dirty Comedy, lots and lots of fun, uh, a way to stay engaged, something I can do in the house with my family. Uh, if you had three kids to try out your kitchen adventures, you would do it too, right? That's going to be fun. Come on. We all gave our babies lemons and watched them be like, <laughs> or maybe it was just me. I don't know. At any rate, that's it for me. You guys have been awesome. I think we're going to probably maybe answer questions or I'm not quite sure, but I'll pass it back to your.